Verse 1, the second plague. <laughs> the Lord spake unto Moses, Go unto Pharaoh and say unto him, Thus saith the Lord, Let my people go, that they may serve me. And if thou refuse to let them go, behold, I will smite all thy borders with frogs. And the river shall bring forth frogs abundantly, which shall go up and come into thine house, and into thine bedchamber, and upon thy bed, and into the house of thy servants, and upon thy people, and into thine ovens, and into thy kneading trough. So basically, frogs everywhere. Now, a lot of people think frogs are cute, but if you had frogs everywhere in your house, you probably wouldn't think that. If they're getting into your food, and you're like trying to roll some dough, and all of a sudden you're like rolling frogs up in it, I mean, it's going to gross you out. Some people are grossed out by frogs, but a lot of people think frogs are cute, right? Baby frogs, tadpoles, whatever. And I used to catch frogs when I was a kid, and I liked frogs or whatever. But, um, you know, obviously to have a plague of them to where they're covering the whole land is a whole another story. And obviously it's a plague because they want it to go away, right? It says, And the Lord spake unto Moses, Say unto Aaron, Stretch forth thine hand, with thy rod over the streams, over the rivers, and over the ponds, and cause frogs to come up upon the land of Egypt. And Aaron stretched out his hand over the waters of Egypt, and the frogs came up and covered the land of Egypt. So just what God said he was going to do, that's what, you know, Moses said he was going to do this, this is what God did. So there's a couple of other times in Scripture where frogs are actually even mentioned. And I'll just have you turn to... Uh, Psalm 78, I'm going to read Psalm 105, verse 30. Frogs aren't really mentioned a lot in the Bible, but they are mentioned in the, in the context of a plague here. Now, the French like to eat frog legs. I don't, that's, there's, that's just one thing that's wrong with French. But <laughs> I love French people. I want them to be saved. But, you know, frog legs, ugh, yeah, it's kind of weird. But anyway, um, they also eat snails. Ugh, I don't know. Escargot is escargros. But anyway, you're in, um, uh, uh, I said I was going to read Psalm 105, verse 30. It says, Their land brought forth frogs in abundance in the chambers of their kings. So one of the, you know, look, and a lot of times government isn't touched by the things of, these, of this world, but God made sure that all these plagues reach inside the actual home of Pharaoh himself and all their rulers, all their servants, all the rich people. Uh, are going to get everything that's coming to him too. Psalm 78 verse 43 says, How he had wrought his signs in Egypt and his wonders in the field of Zoan, and had turned their rivers into blood and their, and their floods that they could not drink. He sent diverse sorts of flies among them, which devoured them, and frogs which destroyed them. So kind of weird to think that a frog can destroy you, but if they're everywhere, they're going to get pretty gross. So turn to Revelation chapter 16 also. Now I've mentioned before that the plagues in Egypt I think are a picture of God's wrath being poured upon the world and I believe that obviously after the tribulation was is when God pours his wrath out on mankind. Not, not all of them coincide with each other but a lot of them are similar plagues that you see on a grander scale throughout the whole world because this is just Egypt. And again, Egypt is a picture of the world, a picture of worldliness, false religion, false gods, and corrupted government. Because, I mean, when Moses comes on the scene, they're supposed to be killing all the, ma the male children that are born. That's how evil and wicked this, this place is. It's not like God just decides to pick a fight. They're also slavers. And obviously, sir, there's a big negative term called slaves and. We're not God's slaves. We're God's servants. We choose to serve God, and that's the proper thing to do if you're a saved person. But obviously, you know, God freed them to be able to serve God. So, you know, freedom isn't just doing whatever you want. Freedom is the freedom to do what's right. And it's right to serve God, isn't it? Amen. Revelation chapter 16, verse 12 says, And the sixth angel poured out his vial upon the great river Euphrates, and the water thereof was dried up, and the way of the kings of the east might be prepared. And I saw three unclean spirits, like frogs, come out of the mouth of the dragon, now the mouth of the beast, 
and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So, you know, it's comparing these three frogs that come out of this river Euphrates. It's, it's comparing them to frogs, but what are they? It says that they're unclean spirits like frogs. Well, what do frogs do? They eat things. They stick their tongues out and, and eat insects or whatever, but they also jump. They leap. They can stick to things. I don't know. I mean, I don't know why it compares them to frogs, but doesn't that coincide with, with, with uh, Exodus, one of the plagues? See, it's the same God that's putting the plagues upon the world as the same God is putting the plagues on Egypt. All the plagues that you see happen in the Bible are from God. God you know, it's not like Moses says, what, what plagues can I plague the Egyptians with? It's like God already told them what the plagues are going to be, and Moses just preaches the word of God like he's supposed to, as the man of God, it's his job to lead the people, and he says what's going to happen. And you notice he does it despite the fact that the government is against him. Because didn't they want to kill Moses? <laughs> they wanted to kill Moses, and he had to live somewhere else for a long for 40 years before he could actually come back, and all those people would be dead. But it says that he saw unclean spirits like frogs come out of the mouth of the dragon, out of the mouth of the beast, out of the mouth of the false prophet, for they are the spirits of devils. So what is it that, that John is seeing here? He's seeing the spirits of devils come out of the mouth of the dragon. So you got the evil trinity here. <coughs> you have the dragon, who's the devil, the beast, which is the antichrist, and the false prophet, which is the false prophet, right? So you got the evil trinity here in these verses here. And it says they're the spirits of devils working miracles which go forth unto the kings of the earth and the whole world to gather them to the battle of the great day of God Almighty. <coughs> so notice how this compares, though, to Exodus. I mean, just think about these verses here. I hope you turned there. Did I have you turn there? Anyway, if you're not there, I'm in Revelation 16. So you see that, you know, this is obviously end times Bible prophecy here. This is the, the, fine, the, the end times beast, the evil trinity. But... We're talking about devils here. Remember I said that God is judging in Exodus. He's judging the gods that they believe in. They believe in some, you know, in some weird stuff. If you look at like hieroglyphics and paintings on the Egyptian walls, they still have their gods are still there. You know, like they'll have like a, a human body and a bird or a hawk's head, right? Or a frog's head or a beetle's head or whatever. They like, you know, they, they get confused about reality but they also worship these things as gods. And so they're worshiping what? They're worshiping devils. It says that they are the spirits of devils. And what are they doing? Working miracles. Now, what is one of the things that, that you've seen so far that, that the Pharaoh's people are doing? The magicians, the enchanters, you know, these people are false prophets. And they are working miracles. That's going to happen in the end times too. So God will allow, you know, people to say, well, they're just, they're just doing magic tricks or whatever. It's not real, not real miracles. It says working miracles there, doesn't it? So it's not just, you know, smoke and lights and, you know, you know there's like a, a, a abracadabra, hocus pocus, you know, the, the rabbit comes out of the hat or whatever. That's not the kind of miracles these are. These are miracles that people are seeing and they're believing these false prophets because of them. Because, you know, a wicked generation seeketh after a sign. But it says, which go forth unto the kings of the earth. Where, 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 were the, uh, where are these frogs coming forth to? The kings in Egypt, right? And it says, and the whole world. Remember, the whole world, was it, what's it representative in our text here? Egypt, right? Uh, to gather them to battle of the great day of God Almighty. Throughout the time that the beast rules and reigns for 42 months, in the end times, he's still going to be in charge of everybody. He's still going to be the king while God's just blasting him with all these judgments at the same time. So, but what, what is interesting about it is that there's still, there will be people that are saved, of course. Um, it'll be like the gold of Ophir. It'll be very rare that people are still saved and alive during the time when all the wrath of God is poured out, but there will be people that are saved at that time. There will be people that are saved that go into the millennial reign of Christ. There has to be somebody left, right? Because all the goats are going to be divided 
from amongst the sheep. And Jesus is going to say, bring them before me and slay them, you know, because they didn't want me to rule over them. Who We're ruling and reigning over somebody in the millennium, folks. People that go into, there's going to be people that are probably just not saved at all, but not necessarily people that have taken the mark of the beast. So you can see easily the symbolism of Exodus in the end times. Turn to 1 Corinthians chapter 10, verse 19. 1 Corinthians 10, 19. Now people will say, well, what's the harm in like these statues? You go out soul winning, you're probably just so used to seeing like little fat Buddhas in people's gardens and stuff like that. And you're seeing, you know, all these different, uh, you know, graven images and statues and stuff. You'll see skinny Buddha, you'll see fat Buddha, you'll see Hindu Buddha, you'll see all these different things. But, you know, even animals and things like that, I mean, God made a provision about worshiping idols. Why is it such a big deal? Well, because they represent something. They represent their false god. And anybody that says, well, Buddhism isn't really, you know, religion where you worship anybody, well, then why are you making a statue of them? Why are you giving offerings to them then? Why are you putting orange peels and, you know, vodka or whatever, they probably, it's not probably not vodka, it's probably sake or whatever, some kind of alcoholic beverage, you're giving them offerings, you're giving them drinks, you're giving them food, you're, you're letting lettuce rot there, some cabbage or whatever. You're doing that because you're making an offering to that God. Don't try to fool me. I know exactly what that is. The Bible calls it idolatry. It says, what say I then? That the idol is anything? Or that which is offered in sacrifice to idols is anything? But I say that the things with the Gentiles sacrifice, they sacrifice, what's it say there? To devils. <coughs> Excuse me, and not to God. And I would not that you should have fellowship with devils. Why is it a big deal? Because of what it represents. Obviously, those statues can't hurt us. But, you know, people are tied to the worship of those things. That makes them evil. And, you know, I, when the Muslims blew up that giant Buddha in whatever country that was, is several years ago now, people were so upset about it. But I thought it was funny. <laughs> I mean, I don't think that we should go around just like damaging people's stuff, but like, again, if we were living under the times of Old Testament Israel, those statues would be getting destroyed and dashed in pieces, and people, the people that were worshiping them would be in a lot of trouble too. So, but I just wanted to show you that, you know, the things that like the Egyptians are worshiping, the pictures that they're drawing, they're drawing them of something that they believe and worship. And it's a false god, it's idolatry, God hates idolatry. It's the beginning of the end for civilizations when they start being drawn to idolatry. You know, it's funny in Washington, D.C., there's just statues everywhere. Yeah. Greek gods, Roman gods, everywhere. And then, of course, the founding fathers that they paint and make giant statues of and things like that. But, you know, those things are graven images. They're not, they're not supposed to be being made. Isn't it weird that Washington, D.C., is formed in a pentagram. Just go on Google Earth, if you don't believe me, and just zoom into Washington, D.C., and it's the perfect Baphomet pentagram. pentagram inside the outline. You know, you're like, well, some Masons did that. Nobody knew about that. Are you, are you telling me that the people, the engineers that built all that stuff and designed all the streets, they, didn't, they weren't in on it? Like, oh, this is kind of weird. You know, why would you make the streets parallel like that and make these weird angles? It's because it's the devil. What, what do you think that you know, America ultimately, the ultimate reason why this place is put here was to become Babylon USA at some point? Right. It's called the New World. Anybody ever heard that term? Yeah. What about the New World Order? You ever heard of that term? Right. You ever heard of, yeah, it's on the $1 bill. It's all over our currency. And you're like, you're a conspiracy theorist. You're, you know, you and Alex Jones need to go. Listen, I have understood these things for a long time. And yeah, Alex Jones was right about a lot of things. I'm not saying that like I agree with all the stuff he agree he believes. I don't. But he is right about some things. Like maybe a police state. I remember watching that video of police state, and when I showed that to people, they're like, You're you know, you're a little out there. Well, now what do you think? Yeah. They completely blocked Washington, DC off when they had the election. Completely blocked it off. That's never happened in our country before. Because the insurrection on January 6th which, did somebody get hurt? 
Did like one of the representatives get hurt or something? They're still talking about it. They're still interrupting people's, you know, Bridezilla shows or whatever. Whatever they're, people are watching on TV, they're mad because they're showing stuff about January 6th. And it's just like, it was nothing. But see, there's, there's a, our government has been taken over completely. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. And if you don't think that, then you're not really paying attention. So anyway, I, this wasn't supposed to be a sermon about that, but <laughs> it is what it is. So anyway, uh, Exodus 8, 7, back in our text. So Exodus 8, 7 so the frogs are unleashed upon Egypt. They're covering the whole face of the earth. They're in their kneading troughs. They're in their cupboards. They're in their beds. I mean, imagine you're just like, oh, you're, just, you're rolling over for that one last snuggle before you go to sleep with your blankie, and then all of a sudden a frog just jumps on your face. I mean, women would freak out for sure. And it's just gross. Like, I mean, to have frogs all over your room. all over, I mean, we're talking about it's saying covering the land, right? And it says... And verse 7, and the magicians did that, or excuse me, did so with their enchantments and brought up frogs upon the land of Egypt. So the magicians were able to do the same miracle, right? Because they're false prophets. They're able to do some things as long as God allows them to do it. See, God has to allow it. It's just like God had to allow Job to be attacked by Satan. Because God does protect his children. He watches over us. He puts a hedge of protection about us. He gives us angels to watch out for us. They're ministering spirits. Now, so these magicians are allowed to do certain things, and then it comes to an end at a certain point. But, you know, the false prophets in Revelation will also be able to deceive and fool people with their miracles. They'll be able to call fire down from heaven they'll be able to do these types of miracles and you know the bible says it's so much that even the elect the very elect would be fooled that's how slick they are at all their uh you know it says they're magicians so what do magicians do they perform magic don't they and you know you're like well, i don't believe in magic well i mean they're able to do what moses was able to do so was it a trick were they robot? I mean, did they have robots back then? Did they have like little for real pets or whatever that, you know what I'm saying? Like there's some pretty intricate looking things that look real, toys that they sell. They have like for real pets, right? Or just animals that are replicas and toys that people play with or whatever. But these are actually doing what, you know, was unleashed upon Moses and Aaron or by Moses and Aaron. So, First, or 2 Timothy chapter 3. 2 Timothy chapter 3. Let's turn over there real quick. And I want to I want you to understand that these people, these people that are doing these miracles in front of Pharaoh, their purpose is to also lead him astray. But the Bible talks about in the end times that people will be you know, fooling each other. Like this person will believe some lie, then they'll like, then they'll teach that person a lie, and that person will teach them a lie. They're just all confused but they're confused in their ignorance and false teachings. Look what it says in verse 7, 2 Timothy 3. It says, Ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. Now as Jans and Jambres withstood Moses, so do these also resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds, what's it say? Reprobate concerning the faith. Like you talk about reprobates too much. Well, the context of what we're talking about is these magicians. Who are the magicians that it's talking about? Well, it actually names them. We never knew the names until the Apostle Paul wrote this epistle. So that was not written in the Bible. I'm sure some people had knowledge of it, but Paul actually names these false prophets. Oh, you shouldn't name names. Well, he just named the names that were resisting Moses. Look what it says. Now as Jans and Jambres withstood Moses... So do these also re resist the truth. Men of corrupt minds reprobate concerning the faith. means that they're rejected. They, they're ever learning and never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. I was listening to this old IFB preacher preach, and I don't think he's a bad guy, but he's like talking about how, you know, you should, you should just pray for false prophets to get saved. I'm just like, oh. Do you actually, I mean, I know the guy's probably saved. He's been preaching for a long time, but how can you come 
to this point where you're like, yeah, we just need to pray for the false prophets to get saved. They're not going to get saved. They're reprobate concerning the faith. We're talking about false prophets like Billy Graham and the Pope that just died and went to hell. False prophet. Every Pope that's ever been has been a false prophet. And the one that looked like the Emperor Palpatine just died like last week or something. He was like, absolute no power and went to hell or whatever. Right? He's in hell. And I know that offends Catholics, but you know what? Why don't you just get saved? And quit following these pedophiles and these perverts, because that's what they are, a bunch of pervert pedophiles. He wasn't saved. The Pope's not saved. Nope, the, the Pope now is not saved. You know, when he's saying, if you follow me on Twitter, I'll get you 10,000 years off of purgatory, you know you're dealing with a false prophet. There, there's no such thing as purgatory. The Bible doesn't teach purgatory. I mean, just, he's, he's, he's trying to get people some free time off by following them on Twitter. Follow me on social media. I'll make sure that you only go to hell for a certain amount of time. For only 1995, you know. It's so stupid. I can't believe that people actually, I mean, what, a, what an abomination to tell people. But the Bible explains that they're reprobate concerning the faith. What does that mean? God has rejected them. Their mind is rejected. And these people, oh, Moses should have just prayed for them that they would find Jesus. No, Moses just didn't want to have anything to do with them. What was their purpose? To turn people aside. What is a false prophet's purpose? To prophesy false things. Yep. They teach lies. They lead people to hell. Yep. That's what they do. So now let's look down at um, verse 13. 9, it says, And they shall proceed no further, for their folly shall be manifest unto all men, as theirs was also. So at some point, their folly was made manifest. And you know when it was? The moment they stopped being able to do the same things that Moses and Aaron were able to do. God didn't just let them continue to do the exact same miracles all the way through. God's like, you know what? I have all the power, not you. You have limited power because I gave you limited power. But, you know, he, the buck stops in this chapter. Now, the frog god that they believed in is called Hecate or something like that. Oh, Hecate. Anyway, uh, it says in ancient Egyptian religion and mythology, Hecate or Hectit or Hect was a frog-headed goddess who personified generation, birth, and fertility. Hecate was sometimes depicted with the frog, or excuse me, the body of a frog, and frog amulets were common in ancient Egypt as charms for, for fertility. Obviously, in a lot of cultures, rabbits are used as a charm. Lucky rabbit's tail, or whatever. You know, lucky rabbit's foot. It's the foot, right? Tail, what am I talking about? It's a fluffy little tail. <laughs> but a lucky rabbit's foot. A lot of people have those under keychains and stuff like that. You know what I'm talking about? Isn't that weird just to like have an animal like <laughs> limb on your, it's like, <laughs> weird. But people have them. People believe in them. So obviously they, they worship some false god that had something to do with frogs. You know what? He's like, hey, you like frogs so much. You like being a filthy spiritual pervert and uh, an adulterer. Of, of spiritual things. Well, how about I just let you have all the frogs you want? You want some fertility? How about all the frogs? And cover the land, right? Verse 8, uh, back in our text says, Then Pharaoh called for Moses and Aaron and said, Entreat the Lord that he may take away the frogs from me and from my people, and I will let the people go, that they may do sacrifice unto the Lord. And Moses said unto Pharaoh, Glory over me. When shall I entreat for thee? and for thy servants, and for thy people, to destroy the frogs from thee and thy houses, that they may remain in the river only. And he said, Tomorrow. And he said, Be it according to thy word, that thou mayest know that there is none like unto the Lord our God. And the frogs shall depart from thee, and from thy houses, and from thy servants, and from thy people. They shall remain in the river only. And Moses and Aaron went out from Pharaoh, and Moses cried unto the Lord because of the frogs, which he had brought against Pharaoh, and the Lord did according 
to the word of Moses. So remember, it's the Lord that's doing these things. According to what God has already told Moses, Moses is telling them. And the frogs died out of the houses, out of the villages, and out of the fields. And they gathered them together upon heaps, and the land stank. And let me just give you a little public service uh, message to our wicked world. You know, don't be surprised when your land is given, when it's given to spiritual whoredom to worship all these other gods, if God allows your land to literally stink. Because that's what happened. They had to pile up all these frogs. They didn't just disappear. There's still a bunch of dead heaps of frogs all over the place. And you know what? When you're a spiritual whore in this land, like the whore of Babylon that you are, then don't, ex- don't, don't be surprised when you can't walk down the street without smelling some kind of stink. Like you do in Portland, like you do in parts of Vancouver. It stinks, doesn't it? You know, when you're filthy on the inside, you're going to be filthy on the outside too. So don't be surprised when God smites you with a plague and with a curse. You know, when you let a, bu- when you let a bunch of garbage just be all over people's property and stuff, don't be surprised when the bubonic plague comes back because all the rats, they're eating all the food in these homeless camps all over the place that you're just allowing to happen. And by the way, this, this morning when I was talking to you about how those, that person pushed that three-year-old off of the, you know, at the MAC station and hurt him, that person was probably a drugged-out maniac. That our city over here, not our city, but the city in Oregon over there supports you know, just all these programs and all these helping, you know, let's help them. Well, why don't you help society and keep them away from people like that? Lock them up. Get them the mental help that they need or whatever. Get them the spiritual help. See, they don't even want us to help them spiritually. They have no answers for the homeless problem. They have nothing. Just here's more money. Here's more money. And it's just, it's total corruption. Everybody's hands getting greased. Everybody's getting helped except for the people that actually need it. You know, they need to be told, get a job and start working. And then maybe you'll eat. Quit begging for money on the side of the road and work with your hands, you 20-year-old, perfectly fine person. You know, it's like, what in the world? We live in a place and in a time where just it's just okay to just be a homeless bum. And you know what? I got I had people threaten to kill me yesterday because I was so mean to homeless people. It's not homeless people. I don't hate homeless people, but I don't like, you know, people that go and destroy other people's property and (coughs) do drugs and leave their needles all out for little kids to grab and pick up. Who wants that? Nobody wants that, but we have to deal with it because you know why? The government that we pay to take care of all this stuff won't even take care of it. They just like, you know, these liberal Democrats will just continue to vote the same people in. They're like, we've had enough. When is it going to stop? When are you going to help us? They're never going to help you. They're going to help themselves. (laughs) <laughs> Exodus 8:15 says, "But when Pharaoh saw there was respite, he hardened his heart and hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said." So that's plague number 2, the plague of the frogs. Now on to plague 3, the plague of the lice. Look at verse 16 it says, "And the Lord said unto Moses, say unto Aaron, stretch out thy rod and smite the dust of the land that it may become lice throughout all the land of Egypt." And that's a lot of lice. Who's had lice before? You don't have to raise your hand if you don't want to. Who has it now? No, I'm just kidding. (laughs) Lice, obviously, is a blood-sucking insect that's really hard to see with the human eye. And uh, they are visible by the human eye, (coughs) especially when they have a belly full of your blood. But uh, they lay eggs in your hair, and they're a plague. They're a disgusting play. Who's just disgusted right? Just thinking about lice right now. All right, it's disgusting. But this is one of the next plague, and that's you know lice all over you, lice in your hair, and your eyebrows, up your nose, and your ears, all over your body. Gross, right? But that's what the plague is, and it's my wife's worst fear. She <laughs> hates lice. They love her hair. I don't know why, but they do. But head lice is absolutely disgusting. It's hard to get rid of. I mean, they have shampoo for it, but if you use the shampoo, it doesn't necessarily mean that you're cured because when they lay eggs, 
They have like a protective membrane that goes over the eggs. And so the poison shampoo that you put, you know, yourself through, it stinks really bad. That doesn't stop them from hatching the other eggs. You have to literally take and sit down and go through people's hair that have it and pick each and every single egg out of their hair. It's really, it's disgusting, right? So, you know, and it's also a plague against wives that won't, that refuse to obey their husbands. <laughs> and for children that refuse to obey their parents, no. But, it, I mean, if you think about it, it's, you know, modern day, it's kind of, you know, it, it can't, maybe it is a plague that God allows people to have. Obviously, he still allows it. There's still play, there's still lice in the world. What purpose do they actually serve? I mean, just to mess with people. But it's kind of a lazy person's plague, too. And so, like, for, I, I remember as a kid, like, I've, I've never been rich growing up or anything, but I remember as a kid, I used to have this lady that was a Catholic. They were, like, really Catholic. And I didn't even understand all that when I was that age. But we used to, it was like an underground barber shop where she would cut people's hair or whatever. And I remember we got lice, me and my brother, from being over at somebody else's house and their house was filthy. And like they would never get rid of the lice. They'd say, oh, we shampoo their hair or whatever. And then even cut their hair, shave their hair. But listen, if you don't, if you don't wash every single thing in the house in the hottest water that you could possibly wash it in, if you don't go through each person's hair in that house with a literal fine tooth comb, and like even then, all you have to do is have contact with that other person that refuses to get rid of it or is too lazy to go through and follow through with all the all that stuff. You're going to get it again or you're going to keep it. It's going to keep on spreading. But anyway, she was like, you know, I know it's really embarrassing, but I promise I'm not going to tell anybody. Everybody knew. Everybody. All my friends at school knew. He told, like, and this is, like, supposed to be my best friend, but we weren't allowed to even go over to their house anymore after that. It's kind of like a a poor kid's, you know, plague or whatever. But it's really lazy, a lazy person's plague. But most of the time you, you get it from people that just, you know, maybe are just more poor, okay? And I'm not saying lice discriminates against people. That's not what I'm saying. I'm just saying it chooses to continue to prey on people that refuse to shower, to, to do the shampoo. And like, we don't even use the shampoo if we've ever gotten it. We use kerosene, my friend. Kerosene. And kerosene will burn them right out of your scalp and burn your, burn your skin too. <laughs> don't light a match anywhere near the hair. But, yeah, I don't know about rubbing alcohol, but I know that kerosene does the job for sure. And, uh, but anyway, I got it and, you know, it's embarrassing. It's embarrassing when you get it, you feel dirty or whatever. But um, my wife, you know, what she believes about it is that if she believes that that's what she gets plagued with when she doesn't obey me. <laughs> I hope it's okay that I tell that story, but she hasn't had it in a long time. But I think God's mercy is just upon her right now. He's being long stuff. No, I'm just kidding. But it is, it's a rough, it's a rough thing to get. I'm not, again, I'm not saying only poor people get it because obviously Pharaoh wasn't poor. Pharaoh's house wasn't poor. All the people that were rich in the land of Egypt got it too. But um, look what it says in verse uh, 17. And they did so, and Aaron stretched out his hand and his rod and smote the dust of the earth and became lice in man and in beast. So even the beast got it. And all the dust of the land became lice throughout all the land of Egypt. And the magicians did so with their enchantments to bring forth lice, but they could not. So there were lice upon man and upon beast. So here you have the end of the false prophets being able to continue to do the miracles that God's men were doing. So, you know, and these magicians, witches, wizards, they have their limits. So, and God didn't allow them to repeat it, to, to repeat this miracle. And I believe it's just simply to show people that God's the one that has the real power. And, you know, if you think about the prophets of Baal, I probably mentioned this before, but... There's 400 prophets of Baal, one prophet Elijah. And Elijah does bad. So it's, you know, God likes to do things with small odds. You know, it's a small odd that he's going to defeat all these prophets of Baal 
but he defeats all the prophets of Baal. And they get up and they're jumping up and down on their altar and they're cutting themselves with lancets and they're, you know, the blood's gushing out and they're going, oh, Baal, hear us. And not a peep. You know why? They're worshiping the devil. The literal, that's who the devil is or was in that culture. They're literally worshiping Satan and God didn't allow him to answer because hasn't Satan answered people at other times? Of course. But God's not going to just allow these false prophets to win against a true prophet of God. It's not going to happen. And so he ends up killing every single one of them at the end. So God, you know, he did the great miracle where he burned up all the, the, the offerings. And even though they dumped gallons and gallons and gallons of water on it, he just want, just so I make sure, let's just dump all this water. Let's just make sure everything's completely waterlogged. And then when the fire came down, it licked up everything and, and consumed the sacrifices. So God's not going to just let these false prophets win. Verse 19, And then the magician said unto Pharaoh, This is the finger of God. And Pharaoh's heart was hardened. And he hearkened not unto them as the Lord had said. So notice that, so remember I told you these people are already reprobates. The Bible says in the New Testament, the Jans and Jambres, probably the main two guys, they were reprobates. Reprobate concerning the faith. Unable to be saved. But even they say, it's not that reprobates don't believe in God. They just don't love him. They just don't trust him. They want something else. They want power here now. They want money here now. And that's the most important thing to them. And so they even admit at this point that it's like, hey, it's the finger of God. What are you going to do? You know? And so then that made Pharaoh even more hardened. So Pharaoh's heart was hardened. So, and, and just, I just want to just talk about this just for a few minutes here. Just an FYI on magicians. Okay. Now, I was at Costco not too long ago. I was doing some Christmas shopping. I saw this like magic kit that they had. And if you've ever gotten a magic kit for your kid, I'm not trying to get onto you or anything, but the testimony that I hear from a lot of these magician type people, that there's no way to explain some of the things that they're doing, like Chris Angel, like David Copperfield, like, you know, obviously Houdini back in the day. Magicians always, if you ever notice the old posters for magicians, there's always devils around the pictures there's always you know it's always spiritism is linked to it and it is little magic tricks like that are a gateway drug into that realm because you're like someone will get into something like that they're doing some card tricks or whatever and next thing you know they're pulling quarters out behind people's ears and stuff and you know it seems all innocent and good but at some point there's a link to These children seeing other older adult magicians doing these amazing things and they want to do what they're doing. And so I've seen multiple testimonies of even modern day magicians that will say, you know, when I was a little kid, my uncle got me this magic kit and the next thing you know, I'm trying practicing, you know, hundreds and hours a day to do all this stuff, you know, and they're just, they're they're doing stuff that is just, how, how could it be possible if it wasn't? some kind of reality to it. And you're like, well, you're just an idiot, Pastor Thompson. There's no such thing as magic. Really? Well, I, we just read a chapter right. where there's magicians and they're bringing real frogs up. Yep. They're bringing, you know, all, you know they've, they've done the plague of the blood, water turning into blood. They've seen, the, they brought forth the frogs and, and they did the snakes in chapter one and their snakes got eaten up by God's one snake or whatever. But let me just tell you something. You can think I'm an idiot all you want. I don't care. But I just want to warn you against these card tricks and coin tricks. And it, it is, it's a, it's a desire to have power that does not belong to us. That's why God says to stay away from enchantment, stay away from charms, stay away from spells, stay away from wizards, stay away from witches. And it says suffer not a witch to live, you know, and necromancers and all this other stuff. Why? Because it's, it's, that's that's Satan's realm. Because if it was okay for us to do, then God would say, yeah, it's okay, go ahead and do magic. But it's not, because it's tied to the devil. And let me tell you something, if you're just sitting there having your, trying to get your kid to be the next Houdini or something, you're, you're, barking down, you're barking up the wrong tree. You need to avoid that kind of stuff. And you're like, well, you know, 
David Blaine, he's not a real magician. No, but do you think that guy's saved? Have you ever heard him talk before? He's, he's freaky. I've seen him do some things that I was just like, wow, how do you fake that? How do you fake walking up to a window where there's some jewelry in the front window and then putting your arm through the window, grabbing out the jewelry? I mean, he does a lot of things that were even way more crazy than that. But obviously some of the things he does is mind over matter or whatever, or mental toughness, I get that. But, and a lot of these things might be illusions. But, you know, the, the thing is, like David Copperfield, I've seen him do some things that were just like, there's no way to explain it. And you might think he's just like one of those flashy magicians or whatever, and it's all tricks or whatever. That, not all that stuff is just tricks. When someone's teleported to an island out in the Pacific, <laughs> And you watch them live, and then that, and then they appear back into the same room. You, how do you fake that? I mean, I, and I'm not encouraging you to see it. I'm just saying that there's there's a, these other people that do. They're uh, called uh, mask changers. Have you ever heard of that? They're, it's like a Chinese art, like a Chinese magician, and they have those masks. You know what I'm talking about? And then they have like uh, the capes, and they flip the capes around. And they'll like go like this, and then their face completely changes. There's, I just don't see how that's possible. They'll take the mask off afterwards, after they've changed their face like hundreds of times or a hundred times. There's no place to put those masks. <laughs> so when they, when they do this and their face changes, there's, there's this one guy, he's the fastest mask changer in the world, and he just went like this, like that, and you can see the, the mask change there's no way that that was, I mean, you just cannot fake that. So these guys are doing magic and they're trying to bring people into their little magician fold and trying to get you into believing in something that you shouldn't be going after, okay? So, and, and you know, notice, again, if you ever just look at, just go and, and look at old uh, magicians' posters and you'll see that they always have devils like helping them in the posters or whatever. You, you think that's an accident? It's not an accident. It's just something that God has forbidden us to be involved in. But we can't help but want to see the unseen. We can't help but want to you know, see things like that. But you know, God warns us to stay away from that junk. And so kids, stay away from that junk, all right? And parents, don't enable that junk. So anyway... So was there a God of lice? I mean, not that I could see, like doing some studies. And obviously, you know, I didn't live that at the time of Moses. And I don't know for 100% surety that all these people that I'm mentioning that, but I mean, obviously, like when it's Britannica, I mean, it's a pretty solid source, okay, for the most part. But anyway, there's, there's no God of lice, but there was Geb, the Egyptian God of earth. And when, it, when the Bible talks about dust, it's just anything that's dirt. It doesn't necessarily, when we think of dust, we think of like, oh, we got to dust the, uh, the shelf or whatever. Or dirt, you know, it's just like loose dirt, but there's mud. You know, earth is earth. So they did have a god of earth named Geb. And it's a myth mythological member of whatever. Also to be considered the father of snakes. Oh, that's interesting. You know, wasn't there a snake in the book of Genesis that talked to Eve? Anyway, it was believed to be, believed in ancient Egypt that Geb's laughter created earthquakes and that he allowed crops to grow. So he's like this, their god of the earth or whatever. So then God says, hey, you know what? You like worshiping some false god of the earth and saying that he, he has this power and stuff? Well, how about I just make all the, the, the earth into lice. How about that? And then he gives everybody, you know, lice, lice in the rich, from the richest person to the king of Egypt, all the way down to the poorest person. They all get lice, all their animals get lice, and, um, you know, pretty, pretty bad plague there. So, anyway, when it comes to, to avoiding lice, I just want to give you a little quick church, uh, Little bit, little bit of advice. There's a reason why my family will sit in the same place every time. <laughs> There's a method to Baptist madness, all right? 
When I used to go to churches that had like junior church and stuff, and, and that's why I say that it's sometimes it's, you know, it's, it's some of the poor families that maybe can't afford to lie shampoo. Now that's just kind of out the window. Everybody can afford it. But there, it would always be like the bus kids. And I felt bad because, you know, but it, came, it became such a plague at our church that like they literally had to say, look, we have to check their hair before they get on the bus or they can't come to church. And so they'd get checked. You know, when I, was, I remember when I was in school, they would do checks. You know, maybe there was a little outbreak and they're like, all right, everybody, here's, you know, and they'd take the, the little popsicle stick or whatever and like look through your hair. Anybody ever had that before? Yeah. It's because it's a plague. Nobody wants to get it. Nobody wants to deal with that. If you have a lot of blankets, you know, if you don't have a wash machine that can handle the comforters that you have at your house, you're going to the laundromat. And then you're also putting stuff in your hair and picking through things. It's just, it is a plague. It's it's got to be worse than the frogs. I mean, is what it's describing here that the whole, all the dust of the ground became lice. It's pretty bad. It's making me itch right now. Anyway, so I'm going to end there and I'm going to cover the fourth plague next week or the week after that or whatever it is. But uh, I just don't, I have three more pages and you got, you, you guys don't have that in you. You just don't. So you think you do, but you don't, all right? So we're going to end there. So we'll, we'll cover the last plague the next time I preach in the book of Exodus. Pastor Bergens will be here next weekend, so we'll have to skip another week. But after that, we should be good, all right? So anyway, let's pray. Lord, we thank you so much for a great day in church. We thank you for the man that was saved today. Pray that you would bless his life and help him to follow after you, Lord, and to come and get baptized and to learn the Bible. Pray for his family, his wife. Um, who has some medical problems. I pray that you just watch over her, bless her, help her to feel better, Lord. I pray you'd help us uh, to think about the things that were preached today, think about the things that we read in the Bible, and to apply them to our life this week. And it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.